Welcome to the road to growth, success of an entrepreneur. We've raised the block. Learn firsthand from successful business owners and create your own path to success. I'm going to show you how great I am. It's time to hit the road to growth with team lead of the Enriquez Group, Realtor Vinny. Hi, you road to growth listeners. Today we have Bob Willer. He is the founder of The Money Nerve. He's also a CPA. He's also a comedian. He, he, yes, I, you heard me correct, a comedian. So a CPA, comedian, I mean, like a peanut butter and a ham, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I mean, walk us through. I mean, you have a lot of hats. Um, I mean, as a, a, a founder of a Money Nerve, and I think, I mean, I, I love what you're doing, the idea of breaking down how people look at, at money, the idea of money doesn't grow on trees, things like that, that we hear at a young age, and it's probably subconscious and, yeah, in our head. So thank you, Bob. Yeah, absolutely. Well, this wasn't originally the path that I thought I was going to be on, uh, to be honest. I was, from a young age, was going to be a lawyer. And so went to college, studied constitution law and law and legal research. And I was taking accounting just to help my grade point average because it was something that came easy. And uh, then I got to meet some lawyers and I thought, eh, uh, maybe not. <laughs> I think, uh, hey, I've got all this accounting. Let me go into accounting. And so, and I think at the time too, um, accounting was a nice, safe place for me. Two plus two is four. Like nobody can change that. I mean, well, you can, but two plus two is four. It's very logical. And there was safety in that for me. Uh, and I worked for a couple of firms, decided to go out on my own. I started my own business. That was terrifying uh, and invigorating. Uh, and as I, along the way, I started realizing that people and their emotions were getting in the way of financial decision-making. I was also doing comedy, you know, to help pay the bills. And uh, then I uh, moved into uh, the money nerve and the CFO of the comedy store. And it all just sort of kept uh, organically uh, moving forward. Well, well let, let's rewind a, a second ago. You see, you talked about you, you met a couple of attorneys, right? When you're younger and you're like, no, that's not for me. Now your probably definition of how you would describe an attorney and a CPA has probably changed over the years. Yet. Do you recall how you would, that young Bob would have looked at a CPA and how they looked at attorney? Yeah. So for me, the attorneys were a little aggressive. There was a lot of politics. It wasn't really about what was right or just. It was about who could win with the best resources. So it didn't feel like it was really about like bringing justice to the world. It was more about, you know, who's got the biggest stick or who's got mm -hmm. the biggest uh, financial resource to beat somebody else. And so I didn't find that invigorating. Uh, CPAs, I sort of looked at as boring. It's just numbers. And also, I think because numbers came easy to me, I didn't feel like I could charge for it, you know, because I had a mindset, it's got to be painful. You can't enjoy it. You, you got to work really hard and it's got to be painful. And so the number stuff was easy. So how am I going to charge people for something that just, it's easy. Makes sense. And now going back to, let's say even a younger Bob, right? We're focusing comedy at that time. Were you focus more on numbers at that time or only kind of came to the realization, like kind of talked about earlier, only in college. I mean, how, who was young Bob? Yeah. So I really went back and forth between, do I want to be a financial wealthy or do I want to be creative, follow my passion? And so I had a parent who was an artist. I had friends that were artists, not making any money. My parents got divorced. It wasn't pleasant. I didn't have choices because I didn't have money. And so part of me said, forget about all that. Follow your passion stuff. Mm -hmm. I want money in the bank. I want to be able to eat. I want to be able to have a, a car that I can pay for the repairs instead of having to wait three weeks, you know, because I don't have the money. And, and so for me, I think because money was a struggle when I was younger, I thought, I, I just don't want to risk that. And so I dabbled in it. I started doing comedy, but accounting was bread and butter. It was reliable. Death and taxes, right? Those are two things you're going to get paid for. Well, having the, the idea of 
being afraid that maybe the the creative side wouldn't get you to where you wanted to get to because you saw the I guess negatives that could could it be there, right? Right. When, when you first got out of college, did you join a, a firm, a, a accounting firm, or did you go off on your own, or how was that process? So interestingly enough, my college was known for having a really solid accounting department. Uh, Professor Sue Legg, who recently passed away, was this amazing woman. And I interviewed with five of the big firms. And what came back to me, the feedback was, we really like Bob, but we get a sense he's not going to stay in the lines. Like he's he's not going to be compliant. And one of the firms actually said it to my face, said, look, we really like you, but we just don't think you're going to follow the rules. And I said, I probably won't. <laughs> like, I'm not just going to be a good little boy, even though that's like what I was taught. Uh, so there was that part of me that was going to not wear the gray suit and just do what I was told. Um, so I ended up my first job out of college. I was the hotel controller for the Memphis Airport Hilton Convention Center. Um, and they hired me because of where I went to college. And, you know, I came into this mess and uh, trial by fire and I really loved it. Uh, but then I decided, you know, I've got all these accounting courses. I'm ready to sit for my CPA. I'm going to sit for the CPA exam. And so that's what I did. I moved out to uh, West Los Angeles, Santa Monica area and got my CPA and uh, haven't looked back. Did you have money stored away? that allowed you the opportunity to kind of start your own uh, CPA company or was it living basically? Oh no, living on a dream. <laughs> <laughs> Let me tell you when I, uh, you know, I just, when I left the firm that I was working for, I just cold Turkey because I was driving to work in tears, driving up the hill going, I hate this job. I hate, I want to work for myself and I want to be able to do some creative stuff. And I literally just walked in and quit and I didn't have a plan. And, uh, you know, I, I just sort of figured it out. I landed on my feet. It took a couple of years. Uh, when I first had my own office, I had a couple of folding tables and a couple of folding chairs. People were coming in to meet me. I'm like, sorry, I'm just uh, it's pretty fresh. <laughs> like, it was it was rough. It was rough in the beginning. <laughs> and, and when you're getting your business going, how were you growing it? Was it strictly word of mouth? I mean, you seem like a very outgoing personality. So I think that'd be the direction or? Well, it was, you know, it's interesting. Uh, if, if I go into a crowd now, I can do this. But earlier on when I would go into a crowd, I was very awkward. Uh, you know, I can get up in front of a crowd and talk to people as a comic, but actually ask me to interact with people. And I became very socially awkward. And, like, uh, uh, and uh, but I could force myself because I knew other people expected me to do it. So I would just I could force myself to go out and and be friendly and reach out to people. And one on one, I was really able to connect with people. And so it was all word of mouth. Uh, people would say, hey, I'm working with this guy. He seems really on top of it. He's nice. Uh, and he and he explains it in ways that's not condescending or, you know, like, how could you be so stupid? Everybody should do this. And and so that really helped. And I just kept building the practice through referral and. What was interesting, though, is even probably the first 10 years, every tax season it would start, I would think nobody's coming back. They're all going to like nobody's going to come back. I'm going to have nothing. And then it would come back and I'd get another 50 clients, another 100 clients. And it just kept growing exponentially. Finally, I trusted it. But in the very beginning, I kept going, oh, they're not going to show up. They're not going to show up. I'm, you know, it was just my own crazy mind playing, playing games with myself. When do you remember that moment where? You said, okay, they're coming back. Yeah, I think when I was finally at 500 clients and I thought, okay, look, you started out with 50 clients. <laughs> it went to 250, it went to 400. They're coming, some of them are coming back. Maybe you lose three or four, but uh, they're coming back. And yeah, and I really didn't lose anybody the first few years. As I got bigger and my rates went up and I got more uh, expertise in certain areas, yeah, some people dropped off, but I didn't take it personal anymore because I knew that they had outgrown me or I had outgrown them. Now, you talked about the idea of the uncertainty of people coming back. At what point in time did you take the plunge of hiring, let's say, admin or assistants or people underneath you? How long did was that process from start? It probably took me about, it's probably about the fourth year that I hired a person. 
and they were working for me and I had helped them with some other, they had worked at a couple of clients. I hired them when they were 18 and they had been doing bookkeeping. I pushed them through college because they were, I'm going to quit. They were the first person in their family to graduate. I'm like, you're going to college. I don't care what it takes. So they graduated and then they came to work for me and that was awesome. And then I remember I needed another person, but I didn't need a full person. I needed a half a person. <laughs> I needed 1.5. And so I put an ad out there for a part-time job and this guy showed up and I realized he was going to be awesome. And I just figured, you know what, I'll figure out a way to pay him full-time because he needed a full-time job. And I just made it work. And it's so important in getting great staff. And, and so for me, it was making sure that they felt like they were part of the team and making sure that I included them so that it wasn't just Bob did your taxes. It was this team effort. So I always needed a team and I, feel like I attracted a lot of, of great people who now sometimes my past employees will come back and say, you ruined me. I'm like, what? I'm like, I, it's hard working for other people because you let us have a voice. You, you, you know, you valued our opinions and you actually talked to us like we were human beings and uh, not everybody does that. So you, you talk about the idea that you were looking for a part-time person, right? The, the value was so good with that person that you hired him full time. Yeah. Do you still to this day, do you hire for, for need or basically when you see talent, you just have to find a way to work? Well, if we need somebody, obviously we look for somebody, but we're always keeping our eyes open. So if somebody comes along that we realize they're in between jobs, we'll hire them. We, because really getting great people is just the luck of catching people in between other jobs. It's not about luring them away from somewhere. And I don't like to do that. But if you, if somebody's coming through and you say, wow, that's a keeper, keep them. So we always just grab uh, people that we think have talent and we find work for them because there's plenty of work. Always. We are fortunate enough to be able to turn down work and be selective in who we work with. And so yeah, always grab talent when you see it. Now you're you're four years, five years into it. When did you start actually doing some comedy or getting back into comedy? Were you doing it beforehand? So I had I was doing it at the same time, but you know it's interesting. I was doing it, um, I was doing it sort of. I was taking classes and I was doing you know where nobody would see me. And of course, I was waiting to be discovered in the back office of an accounting firm. And one of my friends said to me, hey, Bob, when are you going to just stop taking classes? And when are you going to get up and perform? And I'm like, no, you know, I will, I will, I will. And she goes, look, here's this company, this uh, improv company. They're auditioning people for a new show. Go audition. I'm like, oh, OK, sure. And I went and auditioned. Uh, I got in and I became part of the company. And so I did sketch comedy and improv for a couple of years, which is working with other people. And then I realized, yeah, I really do love being on the stage. And it was a great place to say what I was thinking, but as a joke. So if I was like, you're mean, or I hate you. I was kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Right. So I could backtrack. And I started doing stand up, and it went well. And so I, I found it was the place where I could have a voice. And even though it seems strange to a lot of people, uh, I felt really safe behind the microphone. And I could really sort of say whatever I wanted. And uh, yeah, it was, it, it's a lot of fun. There's nothing better than making people laugh. Do, what do you feel as a, as a business owner, comedy, stage comedy, the classes, what did that, that provide to your, your day job, I guess, your business world? I mean, was there benefits of it? Where do you see the benefits? Absolutely. So it, it helped me in a couple of ways. One, it helped me just be able to connect with people a lot easier because I'm on stage, I'm talking to people. And so even when I met new clients, I could usually win them over in a conversation because I was comfortable enough to just have a conversation and be real. The other piece that really was helpful is humor is a great way to disarm people. So when people are making financial choices that aren't serving them, I would tell them a funny story about somebody else. And then midway through, they'd say, you're talking about me. I'm like, really? Oh, no, no, really? <laughs> you know, and so it was a way to get people to see it from a different perspective and lighten up. And so I use comedy uh, really to 
tax stuff is stressful for people and financial stuff is very stressful. So if I can find a way to make it fun without making fun of them, uh, it just makes for a better meeting. Did when you first started as a CPA building your business, did you have to change your persona from comedian Bob to CPA Bob, or did you allow that to, to mingle together when you first started? I, I do think they mingled together pretty organically, but when I was meeting with people in the beginning, I did sort of try to just be accounting Bob and I'd be in a meeting and then somebody would say, you know, Bob's just a comic. I'm like, Shh, no, 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 don't say that. Like, I remember I had to, I was in a deposition once uh, over some royalty stuff for a, 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 a known person and the attorney wanted to discredit me. So he brought up the fact that I was a comic and, uh, and I said, well, just because I'm funny or not funny doesn't have anything to do with my credentials as a CPA. You don't get to negate me. And so it was interesting, though, they were trying to use that. So I did sort of sometimes try to temper the uh, the comic Bob. Did, did you I mean so it sounds like you were pretty much OK with being a comedic style. So the reason why I ask, I mean, I know for myself, it was a long in being in the real estate field. I mean, I, I would have to give that persona because people wanted to work with someone that was, um, I guess, very, very even kill, not very too comedic. And then over time, once you actually have that abundance of business, right, you, you start going, you know what? I don't need to work with everyone. I'm going to show who I truly am. And the people right. that want to work with me are going to want to work with me. Yeah, absolutely. Well, it's interesting, though, for me, I ended up getting a lot of clients for the classes that I took, the workshops okay. that I took. And so a lot of my clients were entertainers already. Okay. Um, and so it was more with the manufacturing companies or other places where I needed to be, you know, accounting Bob. Yeah. But uh, a lot of my clients were already in the entertainment world anyway. And a common theme, though, would be, hey, Bob, we hope you get really successful in comedy and all that other stuff, but you can never stop doing our tax returns. I'm like, <laughs> OK, sure. No problem. <laughs> what do you feel has been the most difficult thing in building your business, building your brand? And I know you ventured out and, and, and build the, the money nerve right over time. Mm -hmm. I mean, and that's kind of even growing your brand even bigger. What has been kind of the most difficult thing? I think the hardest thing in accounting is we're sort of babysitters and we're sort of, even though we don't see our clients all the time, we have to imagine what's going on because we see them once a year. And so what happens is, uh, my, I brought in a partner a couple of years ago and we laugh about the fact that we have to have, um, you know, we're control freaks, you know, and um, we're just constantly, uh, you know, what's going on? What's going on? What's this? What's that? And so you never really get to let that go. Even when I'm, I go on vacation, I'm still like, let me check my emails. Is somebody this need to make sure that we don't miss anything because it has legal and financial impact if we're not on top of our clients' needs. Mm. And then when, how long after you started building your, your CPA business did you venture off, well, not venture off, but expand into Money Nerf? So that was about uh, 12 years in. I had been aware that my clients weren't always uh, doing the best thing. And a lot of times my tax appointments turned into therapy sessions. But what really happened for me, I became the CFO at the comedy store and a lot of my friends are comics. And so I was talking to a comic at the comedy store and she had just come back from visiting her family. And she said, oh, my God, I'm such a failure. You know, my brothers and sisters, they're all doctors. My dad's a doctor. Um, and I just got totally shamed because I chose to go into stand up comedy. I'm such an idiot, you know. And I said, wait a minute. First of all, half those doctors and lawyers and all these people you think are amazing and have it together. If you actually saw the numbers like I did. You wouldn't want to be them. Uh, and, and second of all, you're not the only one that doesn't understand or didn't have financial literacy. You're not alone. And she said, what? And I realized then I wanted to write a book and I wanted to start to educate people to help start conversations about money, to help remove the stigma of shame about past choices we made. And I really wanted her and many people to know that you're not alone. Uh, that we all struggle and that when we make financial choices that don't serve us, we keep it a secret. We're not running around going, hey, I just filed bankruptcy. My credit card debt's at 35000 My bank account's overdrawn. I just lost all my money in crypto, right? We, don't, we just don't share that. And 
So I, I really wanted to start this piece about the psychology of money to just let people know that like, hey, you don't have to beat yourself up. And yeah, there are many people that just are very successful. Don't it just organically happens for them. But for a lot of people, it's a struggle, even if we present differently. Yeah, and I think that's the difficult part is basically when we're in our own struggle, we think that everyone else is having such a fantastic life. And so it makes it even harder for us to kind of fight through it. Uh, as you've been building the, the money nerve, what's been the feedback that you've been getting? How have you expanded it? How have you grown it? How has it been synergy with your own uh, CPA business? Yeah, so the feedback we've gotten is it's really, really helpful. This is an amazing perspective. It's a different perspective because even if you listen to the Dave Ramseys of the world, they'll tell you what to do, but they don't address the underlying issue. They'll just say, stop spending. Okay, great. But that doesn't take away that underlying need or compulsion. And so a lot of people came at me and said, wow, this is just a different perspective. I never really thought about this. And I've gotten a lot of feedback for people that have started looking at stuff and journaling and doing workshops or doing my course and come coming back and saying, I have so much money now. I didn't realize I had such a negative mindset or I started tracking my money and I, because I didn't want you to ask me questions about it, I didn't spend, so I didn't have to write it in my book, uh, right? And so whatever the reason, they changed their behaviors. And so that's been really great. And now when I do speaking engagements or I do workshops, it ends up bringing in new clients to the accounting business. I just did a continuing edu course, education course uh, on the you know healthy relationship with money with psychiatrists. And a couple of people reached out after seeing the seminar saying, hey, <laughs> I need a new CPA. I have some issues. And and so it's really helped build the practice. And it's for a lot of people, you know, I also have a podcast called Money You Should Ask. And again, I talk to successful people about their failures. I talk to them about their early belief systems and self-sabotage so that other people can realize even successful people struggled, struggle, will continue to struggle. It's about perseverance and pushing ahead. What do you see or and what have you heard as one of the the, the big, uh, I guess, misconceptions or failures in teaching maybe kids or young adults about money? Well, I think one of the misconceptions is children are too young to understand. Hmm. And if they're old enough to pick up a penny and eat it, they're old enough to talk about it. Uh, so I think that's one misconception. And the other misconception, I think, is that kids will find it boring and there are so many kids that are interested. It's not that they're obsessed with it, but there are there's like teen financial freedom podcasts and websites. These are like 14 year old kids that are wanting to get educated about money. And so you, if you make it interesting, if you make it fun, uh, money and financial literacy can be really interesting. And it's so important and so needed. If if let's say we're talking in, in five years from now. Where are you going to be? Where's your business going to be? Where's your platform going to be? Where, where are you going to be, Bob? Well, five years from now, where I'd love to be is probably working only one or two days at the accounting firm. Uh, I've, I'm sort of working towards working less days here. And then I really want to be out doing workshops. I'm working on a children's book series on uh, financial literacy. Uh, I'm working on a couple of screenplays with some folks that we're getting ready to pitch. So I want to get really back into the creative and allow the passive income that I've created from the CP CPA firm and from the other stuff to continue to finance all my passions. So the, the let's say percentage wise, we're talking about like 20 percent focus on the CPA, 40 percent roughly on the like screenplays, creative stuff. And then how much in the stand up? You know, probably about um, maybe 15% because I get to do stand up when I do workshops. I get to play when I do speaking engagements. I incorporate that. You know, I, I was a keynote speaker for a financial brokerage house. And afterwards, uh, a couple people came up and said, if you, You've done stand up comedy because, <laughs> I mean, you made this really fun. Um, but it was great because I was also tying together the three other speakers and their topics. But then, having a little bit of fun, but also helping people look at legacy and look at what are they wanting for their life and are their spending habits in integrity and in alignment with what they say they want. And so I can come in with some really serious topics, 
but give it a little bit of fun and get people really thinking about it. Is there, let's say, you know, that person that, that you were when you were younger in, in, in college, right? Where mm -hmm. it was accounting, the numbers are just make sense, right? Yeah. And you had this creative mind, right? Mm -hmm. And like we talked about already, the idea of a CPA being creative, comedic doesn't make a lot of sense, right? Right. Let's say someone else is, is, is getting out of college. They have your kind of personality, but they're looking to be, let's say, a CPA, or attorney, somewhere where it, you don't really have that comedic feel that kind of jives with it right off the back. What advice would you give that would give that kid? I would say definitely nurture your creative side, nurture the passions. Even if it doesn't become a full time gig, you can certainly get pleasure from following your passion. So if it's playing music, uh, I know a lot of attorneys that will say, look, I always had the, the performance bug in me and being a lawyer in a trial gives me that. And so when I was in acting classes, when I was in uh, comedy classes, there would be lawyers and people in practical fields, but doing it to just sort of help make them a little more human uh, in their own business. So uh, you definitely want to follow those things, uh, uh, follow your passion, um, and, and maybe it'll lead to a lifetime career, uh, but be real clear about what you want and what you're willing to do to get there. How was there a way, I mean, because I know there's a lot of people probably listening right now, when you're starting a business, starting your own company, right? You go, I have to focus fully on the company. I have to sleep less. I focus on the company. I have to read. I have to focus on the company. Yet for yourself, when you were starting, you had this such a strong passion, it sounds like, right? Where you're doing the classes mm -hmm. and you were okay leaving your business for at least that hour of time mm -hmm. to do it. What were you telling yourself to say that that was okay or even in thinking about it at that time? I think what I was telling myself and even what I tell myself now is I don't want to work myself to death. Mm -hmm. And even though I can be a workaholic and I love to do many different things, if it's not fun, if I'm not having fun, if there's not pleasure, I don't really want to be involved in it. And so I don't mind working my business and putting in all kinds of crazy hours, but at a certain point I get to go have fun. And like that was so important to me. And what I discovered is when I worked for other people and I would say, look, I'll work for you, but I also have to do, you know, my comedy and I've got to do these other things. People would constantly say, look, you're really good at what you do. So why don't you just stop with the silly little creative stuff and just focus on making everybody a lot of money? Cause you can make a lot of money. We can make a lot of money. I'm like, yeah, but I can't make a lot of happiness. <laughs> like, and, and like, and, and so I was interested, it was interesting how many people really tried to help torpedo my dream of connecting to my creativity. Not that I needed to make a million dollars on it. Uh, but I found it was so easy for people to try and talk me out of, uh, doing what was my passion. Makes sense. I mean, any, any last words that you want to kind of provide to the listeners or anyone, anyone out there? I would just say to people out there listening, if you've been afraid of doing something, because I was afraid for so many years of showing up and being seen, uh, I would say find the support, find the spark, get up, do it. Even if people judge you, even if people laugh at you, even if people don't believe in you, if you believe in yourself, go for it. Like there's one life that I know of. There may be more, but at least one and uh, make it worthwhile. I, I I mean, I, I know for myself, I've taken a lot of things away from you, Bob, and I appreciate you being on here. I mean, I think one of the biggest takeaway is be OK with who you are. If it's creative, it's if it's out there. I mean, I, I started only recently. I start wearing Padre hats now in all my pockets. I'm a huge Padre fan. And so, you know, I'm like, whatever. I might have a Dodger, a Dodger guest on here. He's going to have to just enjoy it. So whatever, whatever it is, go with it, enjoy it. And things will work out with that positivity and you know, one step in front of the other. Exactly. Absolutely. Uh, what's the best way if someone's listening right now, they need a new CEPA, want to follow your workshops. I mean, just follow you. What's the best platforms to reach you? Best platform is themoneynerve.com. Uh, info at the money nerve. That's a way to get to the CPA firm. That's a way to get to my workshops. That's a way to find my book. We've got blogs, we've got tools and all kinds of resources. So check us out. And we always love connecting with people when they reach out to us. Perfect. Thank you again, Bob. Everyone, please subscribe, please share. Go find Bob and go on to the money nerve. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thanks.